How's it going, Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week, and welcome to another Chase the Craft podcast, which is sponsored by Zencaster. I've been using Zencaster for ages to create these podcasts, and in that time, a bunch of people have talked to me and asked questions about starting to create their own content to go out on the internet. And I think YouTube, obviously, obviously I think YouTube is a wonderful platform to do it on, uh, but if you want to kind of dip your toes in the water and create content with a little bit less sort of upfront work in terms of production equipment and especially editing, I think podcasts are a wonderful way to go. And Zencaster is an awesome tool to do so. Zencaster is an awesome platform that lets you record remotely with a guest. And the best part about it is that the guest doesn't need to download any software. They don't need to create any accounts. They just click the link and you start recording. It's awesome. Uh, one of the best parts of it, and the, this is the reason I switched to Zencaster ages ago, is that it'll stream between you and your guest in the highest quality that allows you to talk easily without it you know, glitching out, without pauses, without buffering, any of that sort of stuff. But it records locally on your computer and on the guest's computer. And when you're finished, you get those full resolution files to work with in terms of the actual editing for the podcast. But Zencaster have upped their game. They now allow you to edit directly in your browser, which is amazing, especially for someone that's getting into this new and doesn't want to, you know, pay for the Adobe suite. And they also let you host your podcast in the same platform. So you can do everything <laughs> start to finish for a podcast with one login in your internet browser. It's pretty freaking sexy. So go to zencaster.com slash pricing and use my code chasethecraft to get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. This podcast is sponsored by NordVPN. NordVPN is a virtual private network with over 5,400 servers all over the world that act as a buffer between you and the content you view or download on the internet. You can get a great deal on NordVPN with the code STILLIT or the stuff in the description down below and they even offer a 30 day money back guarantee. But why would you get NordVPN? VPNs do have some cyber security upsides basically keeping the content you view or download on the internet private but honestly that's not really the reason that I love NordVPN. The first way that I use it a bunch is for I guess you'd call it marketing purposes. It's really helpful to be able to see what someone in a different geographic location to yourself is going to see when they visit a certain website. But I'm guessing that that doesn't relate to all of you guys. I'm guessing what does is that almost all of you, if not all of you, will have some form of streaming service, whether it be for TV shows, movies, or sports. NordVPN can help you view that game that's out of region for you or that Netflix series that for some strange reason isn't available in your region. In our house, we use it all the time for those movies that will end up getting released in New Zealand, but they're not yet. <laughs> Sounds pretty awesome, right? You can get a huge discount on NordVPN by going to nordvpn.com slash stillit. And you can get four additional months for free at the moment by using the code STILLIT. So thanks, NordVPN. So yes, I know there's been a little bit of a hiatus on the podcast, but it's definitely something I want to be bringing back more regularly. And last time, last month, we had a podcast with Ben from Bad Mo Barrels. He's the guy that makes the cool little stainless steel and wood barrels. It's kind of a, a new idea for home distillers. But to build on that, I thought it would be really cool to bring someone from the industry in to talk about the traditional commercial way of using oak to create barrels and what effects that has, what it imparts into the final whiskey that you're creating. So with that in mind, I think today's guest is the perfect person to talk on this topic. His family has been in the whiskey industry for three generations now. He spent four years as a cooper uh, and then he moved over to Heaven Hill Distillery as a distilling supervisor. I mean, let's just get stuck in with Mitch Wettel. All right, uh, Mitch, thanks a bunch for joining us, mate. Uh, you are one of the wonderful people that I've had the pleasure of meeting through the Whiskey Tribe, basically. Um, we had got to have a couple of drinks together at the Ball. Man, when was that? Like 2020, was it? Maybe 2019. You know, Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a long time ago. Uh, I'm hoping to set that right this year and uh, make it. By the time this pod goes, podcast goes out, I'll know for sure. I'm hoping we've got uh, tickets booked. But it'd be nice to see you again then, man. Yeah, I'd love to see you. Hopefully I can make it too. Yeah, so I hear you've got a new job, which is uh, one of the things that may hinder that. Yeah, that's pretty much the only thing that would hinder that. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, I mean, if they don't let me take vacation, then I won't go. But uh, if they do let me go, you know, then I will go. Luckily, I don't have to deal with international travel or anything like that. It's just whether or not I want to, you know, man up and drive or fly down, one of the two. Yeah, fair enough. So uh, maybe we should start from the beginning, and because uh, you're no longer in a in a uh, profession, or well, you won't be in a profession that's directly tangential to, to what we're talking about. But uh, you do have experience that could be quite interesting to the people that are listening. So do you want us? Do you want to give us a quick rundown on um, what's applicable and what might be interesting to people before we get stuck into the geeky stuff? Yeah. Uh, so basically, I'm a third generation spirits industry. Uh, my grandfolks uh, worked for Seagram's here in Louisville. Um, my father was a cooper for Brown Foreman for a while. Uh, both my father and mother are uh, graduated from the University of Kentucky with forestry degrees, which is a polite way of saying wood science. Uh, I was a cooper, aka whiskey barrel maker, for four years, and then I went to Heaven Hill, where I was a distillery supervisor for heading on four years. Uh, Certification-wise, I'm a level three whiskey sommelier, uh, an executive bourbon steward, and then the people who do executive bourbon steward release other you know, related classes. So I've done their six-day distiller course as well as their uh, barrel aging and maturation course, which is put on by uh, Independent Stave Company, which is one of the largest barrel makers here in the United States. Very cool, man. Um... That's interesting, actually. I might have to have a talk to you afterwards about some of those because uh, yeah, yeah, some of the stuff that Independent Stave Company does, I've been considering trying to organize it's, a trip around it. Yeah, it's really great stuff. I think they, some of them, having worked for one company and talked to multiple other Cooperages, Independent Stave is you know has their own laboratory that where they are kind of trying to push the boundaries. And I haven't seen. Uh, I haven't seen that anywhere else, but I haven't also gone to a lot of places. So, you know, don't want to talk bad about anyone I don't know. Yeah, yeah, fair enough, man. Um, all right, so basically what you're saying is uh, you've got long, deep roots in this industry, um, especially when it comes to the oak side of things, which is pretty cool. Uh, I've been wanting to get someone on to talk about oak and barrels pretty much since I started the podcast, actually. And I think... <laughs> I think a really big part of it is that in a lot of ways, uh, how do I put it? It's kind of the the magic, intangible aspect, ingredient, alchemy <laughs> side of, oh, no. yeah, of, of this whole thing that we all love, right? So mm -hmm. being able to, to kind of peel back the curtain a little bit, have a little bit more idea of what's really going on under the hood, um, the, the the different levers that can be pushed and pulled to change flavors, the different levers that can be pushed and pulled to to change the uh, the overall impression of the spirit that you get at the end and kind of have some idea of, uh, it's still magic, but understanding the magic, I guess, is, is the way I look at yeah. it. Um, is really exciting for me. And I know a lot of people have been requesting this as well. So thanks heaps, man. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, thank you I love talking about it right I wouldn't have done all that stuff if I was like you know what my least favorite thing in the world is yes <laughs> yeah 100% dude it's um, it's cool to be in something you love right it's cool to be oh able yeah. To, yeah amazing be like yes let's talk work not oh god <laughs> yeah absolutely so I, I feel a little inadequate in terms of starting this discussion where the discussion should be started where do you okay. think the story starts? Acorns. On this topic. <laughs> uh, acorns. That's what acorns. Oak, oak trees grow out of, right? Oh, God. We so, got to go all the way back to the chicken and the egg thing. I mean, hey, why not? Uh, Let's do it. All I'll, right. I'll run through that part a little quickly, right? But um, basically, you know, when you choose your wood, that's, you know, kind of like choosing your mash bill for grain. It's It's one of the most important parts. Um, of making a barrel. Um, to make a barrel, you need a veneer grade oak. 
Uh, so very little white oak actually grown in America can be used for cooperage. Um, it is the highest quality oak that we use. So it's actually, kind, you know, it's really important. Um, normally in America, and to be chosen, an oak tree would have had to have grown for like 80 to 100 years before they deem it, you know, worth harvesting. Uh, realistically, that's because, A, you need the, the trunk to be wide enough to, you know, actually give you enough wood. But mm. also the way oak trees grow, they create a canopy above themselves. So after they hit a certain height, all of the branches just move up the tree and they no longer form ones near the bottom. And that's really important because knots are basically leaks. So in a knot, all a knot is, is where a tree uh, limb or branch grew in that tree. So it takes, it's supposed to take 80 to 100 years. We currently have um, a white oak shortage in uh, America for cooperage. Uh, so they are starting to harvest trees as long as 60-ish years. So long as they grew in pretty favorable conditions, they'll be pretty large. Uh, so it's worth it. But yeah, so realistically, the story of most whiskeys started about 100 years ago. At least the barrel part did, right? Uh, so that's my favorite part about it. Right. Because, yeah. So this is, yeah. this is, it's so funny. Whiskey is just one of these things where, uh, the more I delve into it, the more I realize how crazy it is in terms of trying to like the, the production pipeline, right? Mm -hmm. Like who was a hundred years ago thinking, Oh, this is how much Oak we're going to need for oh, yeah, no, that's... whiskey in a in <laughs> hundred years time. It's crazy. Right. It's, so it is. We're completely at the mercy of what was done. 100 years ago that's nuts uh, trees are a renewable resource so <laughs> anytime we go to a little too low it, it's going to come back it's just a matter of you know managing the forests a little better planting a little more uh in america fun fact in 2020 we were growing a cubic meter of white oak every second Woo. um which is a lot. I personally use freedom units because I am in America. So meters didn't mean a lot to me. Uh, so that was 35 cubic feet roughly, uh, which is a lot of board feet. Um, because I mean, when you're looking at a, a whiskey barrel, you're looking at about 275 board feet to uh, make the, you know, the barrel portion. And then a, approximately another 12 to 15 board feet to make both of the heads. So you need a fair amount of wood to make a barrel. Your average tree will give you about two barrels. So we uh, harvest a lot of oak trees. Uh, when I worked at the Cooperage, uh, we made about 3,000 barrels a day. Uh, that was wow. our target. Uh, it was the Brown Foreman Cooperage. So we made barrels for Brown Foreman, who owns Jack Daniels, Woodford Reserve, um, Old Forester, sorry, couldn't get Buffalo Trace out of my head. Definitely didn't make them barrels. If we <laughs> if we did, somebody would have gotten fired. Um, so you know that was one cooperage, and and we used fifteen hundred trees a day. So that's just you know that speaks to the uh, you know, the importance and the just how prosperous whiskey's going right now. How how far back the process was the cooperage involved? Were they just selecting trees so, from someone else growing them or, or were they involved in the actual forestry side as well or so brown foreman owned about half the mills that they bought trees from oh. uh, so they were uh, so they also once the trees were felled they brought them into the mill to cut them into uh, staves they did have to you know when you're using that much they just didn't expand as quickly you know they didn't see it coming right i don't think anybody saw it coming uh, they didn't really own the forests. They had logging companies that managed those forests, and they bought from the logging companies. Uh, that being said, Glen Morangy, uh does actually own a forest uh, here oh, in America wow. that uh, they manage, and they harvest the trees, and they tell Jack Daniels, or the cooperage I worked for, uh, Brown Foreman, the specs they want those barrels made of, and then... Brown Foreman uses those barrels and sends them over to Scotland so they can have their once used barrels to their spec. 
So Glenn Morangi have, have realized that they're so reliant on barrels, even though they're using secondhand barrels, that they basically are owning the process. From acorn till they get it. And they're the second person to use a barrel. So The whole bourbon thing in between is just kind of a... Yeah, like, they're like, thank you for seasoning the barrel properly yeah. for us. Once you get your dirty paws off of it, we will take over. Yeah, I mean, I, I respect that. They make glorious stuff. Like, I love drinking yeah. it. You know, their master distiller is also the master distiller for Ardbeg. I can't say anything bad about any of their whiskeys. So, you know, yeah. hey, good for them. I mean, it's smart too, right? Like, it, that means that they are not at the mercy of, yeah, I guess, the whims of the market either. They can just... They, they mm-hmm. know that they're going to get a certain amount of barrels coming through every whatever quarter or year or whatever they measure it in. Uh, and they can plan accordingly. That's smart. Yeah. I got to, got to yeah, trust I mean, that. I've got to respect that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So you're saying you're getting roughly two barrels per tree. Mm-hmm. I have to imagine that there's a whole lot of uh, offcuts, wastage. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> Because surely that's worth a lot, right? So, what's the what are the kind of the arrangements in terms of who gets what, and I don't know how right. does that work, man? From the sawmill's so, point of view, I guess it is right. Uh, so, the loggers grade it basically when they cut a log, uh, or when they log it, and then the sawmill gets it and they grade it even further. Um, so, we're looking for a veneer grade log, which is the highest possible. It means it doesn't have any limbs. It's not twisted. When a tree grows, it can grow, you know, like um, a corkscrew. We can't have that. Uh, we can't have, you know, angled trees, any bends, anything like that. So we are hyper specific in the logs that we buy. So the overwhelming majority of the time, by the time it gets to us at the cooperage, there shouldn't be a lot of flaws in the wood itself. Um, that being said, I think we account for like 2% of white oak usage. So 98%, eh, who cares? <laughs> what they, yeah, they right. make tree, they make Traeger wood pellets, you know, they make, you know, houses, picnic tables, whatever they want to out of them. So um, it's, it's not that these trees are specifically growing to be turned into barrels. It's that the, the, the Cooper's, take the cream off the top before anyone else gets a pick or, or they're, they're paying a premium to be able to take Yeah, you're paying a premium. Yeah, everybody gets a pick and it's whoever pays the most gets the first. So uh, yeah. barrels cost a fair amount of money just because of that, right? We They can't be made out of just any old uh, you know, white oak and it really does have to be white oak. It can't be red oak. Um, I know Westland's been experimenting with uh, Gary Oak more power to them it is a completely different flavor profile i I was just going to say this is this is probably a a clean spot to be able to stop and have a talk about the species the region all of those things Mm -hmm. which it's something i definitely want to talk about and here's a it's it's a clean spot that i can remember getting back to (laughs) yeah (laughs) because i ramble unfortunately yeah let's jump into that jump into that now um why is white oak special and traditionally that's that's what it's been uh does it need to be that still or is it just that we're doing that because that's what's we what we've always done little a little a b uh basically there's two reasons you would ever use a wood with one caveat um the reasons you would w- use the wood is a it works it needs to be sturdy enough it needs to not leak um it needs to breathe uh, is kind of the polite way of saying it. It needs to be able to basically absorb liquid and expel liquid. Uh, like here in America, we have teak that we make most of our um, like patio furniture and stuff out of because it is just almost perfectly water resistant without even staining it. Right. You could technically make a barrel out of that. It would be a completely neutral barrel because the spirit would never go into the wood. Um, the second thing you're looking for is taste. Like what does this wood impart? Like if you could imagine, I don't know, welcome to America. Our, you know, our education said, I don't know if all have time pine trees, but I know you have tar and pine trees smell and taste like tar. So if you made a barrel out of pine trees, it would probably technically work and it would make awful, awful whiskey. Uh, and the caveat is make sure it doesn't kill anyone. <laughs> so it's a very important caveat because some trees Wait. are, you know, are toxic. Should, 
Should we not have put that as number one? Should that not be? Or, or Welcome to America. Right? Yeah, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> right, right. Uh, It's a very important caveat. Oak, white oak specifically is great at their first two. So oak, the species, has this thing called tyloses in it. And tyloses, slightly hard to explain and gets uh, kind of nerdy about it. They plug wood cells. Wood cells okay. effectively look uh, like a straw from McDonald's or whatever, right? So they are a cylinder that is hollow and open on both ends. And tyloses plug the ends. Basically, after um, as, a, as wood grows, the wood on the outside is alive, and the wood on the inside becomes something called heartwood, which uh, I mean, it's not dead, but it's not actively growing. So it's not really right. called live growth wood. And that's what coopers use, and they don't want it to leak, right? They want the opportunity for the wood to go into the cells, but they don't want it to spill out the ends. Right. So basically, uh, that means if you have a barrel and, you know, it's got that lovely curved shape, if it doesn't have tyloses, it will go into the cell and then it will run up and down the barrel and leak out the ends. Oh, wow. Okay. So you want tyloses. Uh, here in Kentucky, we have this uh, really awesome brandy uh, distillery called Copper and Kings. Uh, they also do gin and they decided to do a, a barrel aged gin aged in a barrel made from juniper wood. And it uh. leaked so badly. Like, it didn't matter. Like, the wood itself was hard enough that it didn't, you know, necessarily, you know, soak straight through the wood. It just ran out the edges, and you could see it dripping just as it <laughs> aged. So not, so what you're saying is not, like, not through the width of the board. It would kind of get into the board a little bit, and then... Yep, just goes in a little bit. And just shoots up the straight. Yeah, because it's it literally is like a straw. <laughs> so that's crazy. Yeah, that is probably one of the m most important reasons that people use oak. But also, yeah. you know, it's robust. It's a hardwood. So these barrels were originally used for transportation. You didn't want to use anything too soft, anything too flimsy, anything too malleable that, you know, when you were rolling it would kind of, you know, flex a little because any flex would just let water or whatever was in there just pour out through the seams mm. uh the second thing is flavor um oak has tannins in it uh you know a lot of trees have tannins in it but you know tannins affect mouthfeel they are flavor tannins are effect uh are the reason for the peachio flavor in whiskey oak also has this thing just super cool called oak lactones in it and guess what oaks are the only one that have those lactones um and they are utterly delicious they're uh, they're responsible for a lot of the vanillins the furfurals um gosh what else and you know a little bit of the spice flavor that you pick up in a bourbon so that's uh for furfurals kind of like smoky uh so if you could imagine you know a whiskey sands vanilla smoke and you know spice characteristic it would probably not be great yeah. um that being said there are a lot of other oaks other than white oak that work gary oak chestnut oak um the thing is they all have those flavor compounds in them at vastly different amounts like gary oak will have zero of i can all so, so, you know, some compound, but then it will have seven times as much of another, you know, that we traditionally associate with white oak. Right. So you'll be getting a completely different flavor profile from uh, Gariana oak than you will, you know, traditional American white oak. So instead of completely giving up flavor sets and moving over to, to like the example you gave before of your whiskey end up tasting like a freaking Christmas tree, it's just that you're you're rejuggling the uh, the hierarchy of flavors. So mm -hmm. instead of having, you know, a, a large spice contribution, suddenly it's a vanilla bomb or vice versa. And that's and and so is that generally why the the oak family works? Is it's just that that like a larger proportion of the species within that family have? I mean, tyloses is number one. Tyloses is absolutely number one, but flavor is number two. I'm sorry. Because because if it's not practical, it's not the logistics don't work. Yeah, I mean it doesn't matter. The, like 
you've got to keep the liquid in the barrel to be able to get the flavor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah, it, it's got to work, thing number one, absolutely. Uh, if it leaks, it doesn't work. If it falls apart, it doesn't work. Uh, you know, flavor is kind of secondary there, but the flavor is really good. Um, a lot of wineries have started as experimenting with other hardwoods, Wineries can experiment a lot better because, you know, their aging is often much, much shorter than mm. uh, spirits. So, uh, oh my goodness, what a lot of things. Experimented with uh, like Acadia wood. They've experimented with chestnut. They've, oh my gosh, a whole lot. And I mean, you're a little lucky being kind of close to Australia. Uh, they have experimented with an awful lot and they have a, I want to say a wine program at one of their universities that is absolutely amazing i read the uh, thesis from one of their students uh it was so good they turned it into a book and sold it on amazon so very cool <laughs> i left to look that up <laughs> yeah, was that recommend. specifically on wood uh let's see here i think it was like oak lactone formation uh ah, here it is it is oak lactone formation in wine and spirits the role of uh, glycodiac precursors, and I said that G word incorrectly because I've only <laughs> ever read it. Not a problem. All right, I'll have to look that up and see if uh, I'll probably just get it to be honest and read it. It sounds pretty fun. This it's is, this a, is it's definitely a scholarly article. So, like, it's one of those things I had to read that with like Google up, so I could Google oh, right. what words meant while I was working my way through it. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Maybe I won't then, because <laughs> I mean, if you were struggling like that, I'm really going to struggle. I'll, I'll just, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll buy you a beer sometime and pick your brain on it. <laughs> honestly, it's just one of those weird things where you know, I'll, I'll say something like, "This breaks down in heat," and then they'll be like, "This, you know, pyrophosphorizes or something like that," and I'll be like, "What <laughs> yeah. the hell does that mean?" And then it's like, "Okay, pyro fire." And you're Google like, that oh. shit. Google. <laughs> and also, that's the wrong word. It's not pyrophosphate. You know, it's it's something else. But yeah, it was. I, I it's a slog. It's one of the shortest books I've ever read, and it took me like three months. It was, <laughs> it was real, real difficult. There's a pretty strong argument that 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 white oak is still immensely important. It really is whiskey. It, it's not just a traditional thing. It it just works, and it does a good job. Is mm -hmm. what you're saying. I, I, I that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, from what I've read and from what people I've talked to, there's just no other wood that does everything that white oak does that has a similar flavor profile. American white oak is, in the tree world, a vanilla bomb. Right. Yeah. So Which is if you could imagine, ones. yeah, like no vanilla in whiskey. Yeah. That would be a pretty big change. Uh, so the uh, I guess the other um, elephants in the room that probably need at least uh, acknowledgement would be French oak, Hungarian oak, Mizanara, I guess. Is there anything else that needs to go into there? What am I forgetting? Uh, technically, Persian oak um, is pro one of the most populous oaks on the planet. Um, Interesting. And we don't use it here in America. Um, French oak is awesome and terrible for certain reasons french oak has a lot higher tannin content um but when a tree grows basically uh, if you go back to thinking about those uh, wood cells i described as mcdonald's straws that means it's incredibly good at making nutrients go up and down the tree but it's not necessarily very good at making nutrients go you know into the center of the tree or out to the edge of the tree and uh, basically, uh, rays, and uh, the, there's a word before them that starts with an M that I'm getting tongue-tied on. Uh, and in American oak, those rays are so small that they're effectively water watertight. In French okay. oak, they're not. So when you harvest French oak, you have to find those rays that go from the center of the tree and then squiggle their way out and not mm -hmm. cut through them. Otherwise, you'll have a leak through your barrel. Oh, like through the width of the board. It'll leak through the width. Uh, it's much more labor intensive to cut uh, a stave out of French oak. Because so, you have to literally read the wood to decide mm -hmm. where to cut. You can't just put it through a mill. Yep. And... Uh, oh, interesting. 
probably talk a little bit how about how the wood is sawn for just a sec so that makes sense yeah. um normally when you have a tree you know it's a circle and they just basically cut it into a square and then cut the boards they need out of that square uh, you can't do that with uh oak trees because if you've ever seen growth rings if you have a growth ring that goes from the inside to the outside of the uh the stave uh, it'll leak so you need a way of cutting those off so it's quarter sawn so if you think of a tree as a circle just divide that in four, and then they just cut that triangle until it's too small to create a board. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Because if you're thinking of a board, like so, if you're if you're looking at like a plank to put it into different terminology, if there's mm -hmm. half circles going from one side of the plank, touching the bottom and touching the the top of the plank, like radials. That in terms of the, the, the growth rings, it'll, it leaks along the line of the growth ring. Is that what you're saying? You never want the growth ring to, uh, to arc all the way through the wood. You yeah. want it to have defined striation. Um, Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I've My always, brain I've is not that... raining very well. well. <laughs> I've heard the term cortisone before, probably just from reading you know, fantasy books or whatever. And I've never known what it meant. Now I do. Uh, and it makes perfect sense. So they literally split it into pizza slices yep. and then cut and edges then off just... the pizza slice until there's yep. no more slices left. And that's basically to deal with those rays because the rays work out in a squiggly line. So you're trying to make sure that one ray never makes it all the way through. Yeah, And if you have an arced um, growth ring, a, medulla... <clears throat> a ray is going to cut through that. <laughs> yeah cool okay so that's beautiful that takes us right back to where we were so i'm assuming it's the it, 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 it's these slices that are then is that what turns up at the cooperage like what what is yep. the raw material that the cooper ends up with so basically um those are exactly what turns up uh they will remove the bark before it comes to the cooperage uh, so we don't have to deal with that uh, and then they get air dried which is an incredibly important step um it's called seasoning the wood. Uh, there is a little bit of discourse that goes on uh, about how Ooh. important it is. I have taken a side and will fight about it. <laughs> um, the longer you season a wood, uh, the better it is, uh, both to work with and flavor profile wise. Uh, so it, it sounds really weird, but just leaving wood outside, uh, it'll lose moisture content. It'll drop down to about 12 to 14 percent. And that's really important because tannins are water soluble. So tannins will begin evaporating out of the wood while it's seasoning. And you mm. don't necessarily want a high tannin content when you're going to be aging something for a long time. Uh, the other thing it does is it allows just kind of mold and moss and anything else to kind of get in there and it actually starts breaking down the wood before you even toast or char it and that's really important because certain certain compounds in wood break down with heat some break down with you know uh, exposure to water some break down with exposure to alcohol some only break down uh physically with you know like a bacteria or a mold or something acting on those and sometimes those bacteria actually Polite word, uh, the impolite word is poop out good flavor compounds yeah, after right, eating, right. you know, whatever they do as they good. So you want those. So, you know, the big guys, uh, they season for a minimum of three months and then they will throw it into a kiln and bring it down to the appropriate amount of internal moisture that they want it to work for you to work with and also to deal with the uh, whiskey that they're getting ready to put in it. But over in France, 18 months to 24 months is pretty normal. Um, I am definitely on the side of the longer you air season, the better. Uh, we actually have a uh, distillery here in Kentucky that has a, uh, a couple barrels that they had air seasoned for four years before they turned into them. And it, it adjusts the flavor. It really tones those tannins down, softens them up. Uh, and it just, uh, everything I'm about to say is not <laughs> a fact. It is something yeah. I experienced drinking. I feel like it allowed the fit flavor to kind of come into the barrel quicker 
right? Mm-hmm. It got those vanillins. It got those furfurals. It got that, you know, all those lovely oak lactones in there quicker than I felt like it would have had it just been a regular barrel. So whenever I do these things, one of the most awesome things that happens is when people say things to completely challenge ideas that I've got, because it makes me think on the spot. It makes me, you know, respect someone else's experience, especially in this kind of situation. Uh, I'm having the exact opposite experience right now, which is uh, bad because it means that I'm entrenching ideas that are my personal beliefs and, and and you're not giving me a a reason to um, be able to justify those. There's just some serious confirmation bias going on here, (laughs) but uh, I've, I've recently over the last six months, uh, I've realized that a lot of the oak that I've used in the past has been, it's not crap oak, it's nice wood, but it hasn't been purposefully prepared for whiskey. You know, it's, it's hard to get stuff here in New Zealand that has been purposely prepared the correct way, you know, so people will get off cuts from a furniture shop or whatever and do X, Y, and Z to it and then hope it works. I've made a lot of, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of products with that. It works, whatever I get a result. Recently, I've got my hands on oak that is from Kentucky that's been yard aged for four years and I've started messing around with that. And the biggest thing that I've noticed is the the older, the, the, the stuff I used to use, it gives a color, well, like really, really, really quickly, like a week it'll get to, because we're using it in a higher concentration of, you know, surface yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to liquid or whatever you want to define it as. Color comes really quickly. Uh, spice sort of flavors come quite quickly. And then you start battling the, um, how do I put it? The, uh, it's a battle of trying to get like that that rich vanillins and kind of oak sugary velvety feeling before it gets tannic and horrible that that's the the past thing i've had this new oak the color comes about the same speed but the biggest difference is the vanilla and the sweetness and the velvety mouth texture is the first thing to show up and now i'm waiting for the spice and a little bit of tannin to kind of round it all out. And that sounds very similar to what you just said. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it tones the tannins down the longer you, uh, you yard age, uh, which, yeah. you know, if you're working with a 53 gallon barrel, that's awesome because, you know, here in Kentucky, that's what lets you go longer than 10 years. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, but also if you're, you know, we have a, another distillery here, Hartfield and company, they use a 6.3 gallon barrel. Like they keep a, you know, a hawk's eye on that thing because you can I'm over sure. oak, over tannin that thing in two days if you don't catch it at the right time. <laughs> yeah, it's like taste it this morning and we're bottling it in an hour, not this afternoon. No, oh yeah, no, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, they, they go through that day to decide yeah. what they're bottling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it's it's just very weird. Uh, it's also one of those things that terroir really aff- uh, affects, like where your oak was grown will affect the concentration mm-hmm. of those flavors again. You know, because a, a white oak grown in Minnesota or southern Canada has a much shorter growing season than a white oak that's grown in, you know, say like northern Alabama or something like that, you know, which is kind of the southern United States. Um because all of those flavor compounds are there accepted flavor profiles based on region or is it just that everyone accepts that they're going to be different like a certain region sought after for certain properties or is it does it not really work that way uh yes and no really what it is is the the growing season will either tighten up or loosen the growth rings on a tree Uh, okay and uh the tighter the rings kind of the the sweeter the barrel um So it has just a higher concentration of those flavor extratives that you can pull out of it. So you can get a nicer, better flavor quicker if you have super tight growth rings than if you have kind of your your wider ones. Mm. So my layman's understanding of the difference in the flavor contributions that I'm getting from that wood was something along the lines of, I'm going to tell you this and then you can tell me uh, either how I'm wrong or how you can say it more correctly. <laughs> Feel free to do it. Good either. luck. I've been stumbling over my words tonight. Right? 
Um, to me, it feels like it's almost it's almost like the wood is um, it's already gone through the process that was happening in quote unquote the barrel for me before it got put in spirit. So it seems like the the wood that hadn't been yard aged for a long time it needed the alcohol itself to start breaking everything down and releasing what it needed to release. Whereas it felt like the stuff that's been, that has been yard aged and seasoned correctly, that process had already started. So it was literally just ready to leak. <laughs> yeah. Um, into the spirit. Is that somewhat correct? Am I thinking about that? That is. Way? Yeah. I mean, if you brought a scientist in to crit- critique you, I'm sure he would find something. But right. effectively, yeah, that is what's happening. Basically, the, the air drying has started breaking down those chemical bonds between the cellulose, the hemocellulose, and the lignin. And once you break those bonds, it allows the hemocellulose to start breaking down into sugars and the lignin to start breaking down into those more complex and super fun to say molecules. <laughs> uh, so if you pre-start that process then you don't have to work, you know, wait for, you know, fire, toasting, alcohol, or any of those other things to start that process. So it's just, it's already there. Yeah. Interesting. So if, um, I can, I guess now too, we're starting to get into the point where if there's, uh, uh, people messing around at home that aren't going to be buying barrels. So, so all of this information is super interesting for people that are that are in the industry, uh, people that want to get into the industry, people that are thinking of starting their own distillery. Um, but I also have a, a segment of the, the the listeners that are just kind of wanting to follow along at oh, home. Yeah. They have my heart, believe me. Yeah, <laughs> I guess we're starting to get to that point now where they can start playing along, right? Mm-hmm. So, in terms of seasoning oak. What can you tell us about how to go about that process? So the most important important part of seasoning oak is airflow. So you do not want to put it on top of something because there will be no you know no airflow going on that. You don't right. want to put something on top of it. Uh, if you buy multiple pieces of wood, um, you're going to want to put literally just small little Jenga block size pieces of wood in between it to keep that airflow going. Uh, if you don't keep that airflow going, uh, it will never lose the amount of water that you want it to. Uh, so you are not necessarily effectively air seasoning it so much as you are air molding it. And that creates kind of bad flavors. Um, don't get <laughs> chemically treated wood. Uh, <laughs> like that's the third caveat, right? Don't poison yourself. Um, if you can find white oak that hasn't been chemically treated, and you have time, you literally put it outside. You don't cover it. You don't, you know, you can keep it inside. Uh, it's, I don't, it doesn't actually help that much. That's actually a little worse for it. But just outside in the elements, slightly elevated. It doesn't have to be, you know, like, oh, I've got, you know, a car jack that I keep everything on and it's, you know, <laughs> six feet in the air. You just need it to where it's not touching something else. Um, preferably leave it for months. Uh, If you can hit years, that's awesome. But if you don't air dry it for three months, it's going to taste funky. And so I've, I've heard that it getting wet, like repeatedly getting rained on and then drying and then rained on and drying is a advantageous thing. Is that? Absolutely. Uh, That helps pull those tannins out because you're, you know, tannins are water soluble. They're not alcohol soluble. So as mm. the the wood get rain, gets rained on, tannins will have been broken down kind of through those natural processes of just, you know, the, the ambient microbes in the air breaking that down. And then the tannins will, being water soluble, go into the water. Then the water evaporates and you lost some of those tannins, which very is cool. very important. Like I cannot stress enough. <laughs> how important like mitigating initial tannin impact is uh there's a joke in kentucky um you spend the first six months uh imparting flavor into uh your whiskey and then you spend the next six years taking that flavor out (laughs) because it's not good is there an optimal size for wood that is uh how do i put it i have to imagine as as a, especially as a large 
Cooper that there is a a constant push and shove between optimal for flavor and optimal just for logistics and economy and economy right. of scale. Um, so forgetting the economy side of things, is there an optimal size of wood or dimension of wood for seasoning? Or does that match up the same with? So basically it depends if you're trying to make a barrel, if you're trying right. to make a barrel, you're going to want about an inch and a quarter thick stave because you're going to be shaving it down thinner because you're trying to, you know, put a bevel in it. So you create, you know, a circle when you put it all together, instead of like a duo centecadehedron or whatever it is, you know, (laughs) something that has like 28 sides on it. Um, But if you are just using, you know, wood put in, in your aging vessel, no, there is no minimum size. Uh, With the caveat, if you are charring the wood, uh, charcoal does not add flavor. You are creating effectively activated charcoal, which is an absolutely inv- invaluable part of filtration. And it pulls out, you know, like a lot of your copper, a lot of your phenols, a lot of those things you don't really want, but it adds no flavor. So if you plan on charring something, you have to make it thick enough that you can catch it on fire and it doesn't all become charcoal. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's assume that we've got to the point where this uh, oak is seasoned to our liking. Uh, what's the next step in the commercial operation? Uh, because by all accounts, the the wood can come out looking pretty freaking gnarly out of the yard. Oh, yeah. 100%. Um, so if after you've seasoned it, uh, they still check the moisture to make sure it's where they want it. Um, and they may actually still end up kiln drying it just a little bit more. Um, just cause the drier the wood is, you know, the easier it is to work and also the more spirit will immediately, you know, d- dive into it. Um, so the next thing they'll do is you, uh, bring the stave in, you basically cut it down to length, um, because when you're drying wood, uh, it likes to split on the ends. Mm. Believe it or not, it's easier and cheaper to buy wood slightly too long and then just cut a little bit off of every end than it is to buy the appropriate length and hope it doesn't split. We'll just end up wasting <laughs> right. so much more. So you cut it down to length. Uh, then you run it through a, a planer, both top and bottom, and that's what puts that bevel on it. And that takes off you know, all of the nasty growth <laughs> that has you know, possibly been going on while you were air seasoning. Get rid of the fairy stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that stuff is very important for making good flavor, but that stuff is not good flavor, right? <laughs> right, um, it's part of the process, but get rid of that shit. That's yeah, no, no, I mean, also caveat, right, that some of that stuff can be poisonous. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so after that, you're effectively left with a board that is cupped, uh, running along the whole uh, end of it. Uh, it goes to a joiner. Um, when I worked there, it was done by hand. Now it's done by computer. Uh, basically the joiner, if you think about a barrel, you know, it's, it's curved, it's wider in the middle, right? So that means you need to take wood off of the top and the bottom and leave it in the middle to ensure that it's you know a little bit thicker. Uh, you also have to turn it from a straight sided board to a slightly, you know, beveled board. So when you build it, it's not just, you know, a line of wood that does no one any good. You need it to create a circle. Uh, and the way you, you used to do that manually was you effectively took a circle and you put angled knives in it. So that way, uh, the edge of the circle, the knife would be sticking out further and the interior of the circle would be, you know, not sticking out quite as far. So if you think of, here's a, here's a jigger or a bowl, right? If I were to push something into this, it would create kind of a beveled edge as you push it in, right? Because this is further out than this. It's obviously exaggerated, but we're just trying to remove, you know, maybe an eighth of an inch more off of the outsides than we did on the inside and to put that slight undercut in it. That's also when uh, we inspect for anything wrong. So uh, (laughs) fun things you find in wood, right? Uh, In America, Bullets, lots of them. Um, Dude, 
<laughs> didn't even think about that. Yeah, because you don't want your whiskey having lead in it, right? Uh, well, uh, it's not that. It's it's you've got spinning knives going really, really oh, fast, right. and if it hits course, metal, yeah. that's bad. Uh, so that same goes for like nails, barbed wire that's grown through trees, things like that. Uh, but on the natural side, you know, uh, small knots that maybe you know a, a twig started to grow out of and then mm. bro- broke off before it could become anything. Worm holes. Um, worms love to eat oak, and a very interesting thing about them is as they eat, uh, they poop as they go. So it looks, you know, like it's solid wood with just like a weird, you know, lighter color in it. Mm. Uh, but worm excrement is alcohol soluble. <laughs> so the moment you fill it with alcohol, suddenly you got all these pinhole leaks coming out of it. So what you're saying so also is that there is a very high chance when you drink whiskey that you are uh, drinking at least a minuscule percentage of worm crap. I would put it at, if it is a heritage brand, it is 100%. There's not even a very high chance. It is just, <laughs> it is. Oh, dear. That's how you know it's the good stuff, man. I mean, it's it like, really is. Yeah, I mean, if a worm yeah. will eat it, that means you should be able to eat it too, right? It didn't die. <laughs> oh, dear. All right, so you've, uh, you see comes in big at this point. but That's interesting to me, too, that it's, that it's done at this point i guess it's the same idea as the ends of the board splitting it's just easier to assess it once it's been dressed once the timbers mm-hmm. look at it right like because now it's finely dressed rather than rough sawn. right when the wood's green it's you know sappy there's a lot of water involved it's very hard to see a lot of those like wormholes and other stuff like that also if uh if there's only one problem in the in the board as a cooper, you know, when you're joining the wood, AKA, you know, using that joining wheel, you can notice that and cut it out. Mm. So, you know, it is inspected. Like they run it through a uh, metal detector at the, uh, you know, at the logging point because they, when this gets to the sawmill, they don't want to mess up the sawmill. The guys who uh, quarter saw it also inspect it. But, you know, humans are fallible. They miss a lot of things. Also, some of them you just can't see when the wood's green. So it's mm. inspected all throughout the process. Crazy. Um, after the ju- – oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, so now we're getting pretty close to actually putting the, all of these individual pieces of boards together. That's barrel, exactly right? the next part. Uh, so it's really weird. Uh, it's called we call It's called raising a barrel. Effectively, you get this – super strong iron hoop that is the exact size that you want the head of the barrel to be uh and you just start shoving uh staves into it which is what the boards are called at this point after you finished them um if it's a huge industrial process every single board will have the same angle so they'll tell you how many staves need to be in a barrel to make sure that angle is correct um because you know you've got 360 degrees Every single stave is cut at, you know, certain degree angle. That means you need 27 in this barrel or you need 31 in this barrel to make sure those angles add up to 360. So that's not a standard thing like that. That depends on the like, will any one commercial outfit always do the same number of staves or is it vary depending on season or wood? A solid average is 29, like 30 ish. Uh, but it depends on how wide the wood you're receiving is. If you're getting a oh. lot of just narrow wood, like it's kind of the job of the supervisor or the foreman or anybody to go out there and be like, wow, you know, this wood is really narrow. We're going to, we're not going to be able to put, you know, 29, 30 in the barrel. We're going to up that up to 32 or 33. Mm. And then, you know, the joiners who were making the, uh, the staves have to adjust their knives angle so that it comes out correctly. That's crazy. I hadn't even thought about the fact that you'd have to roll with the, you know, just roll with the material like that. Now that you say it, it makes a whole lot of sense, but it's just one of those things I wouldn't have thought of. Right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but smaller, smaller cooperages don't do that. Right. Like they just, they will make the uh, correct amount of uh, staves and will vary the uh, the angle they put on them based off of the thickness, especially if they're using computers. 
Like they'll just be like, Oh wow, that's a real thick stave. We're putting a tight angle on that because you know, it's taken up more of the circle. So it needs a slightly more acute angle or, mm. Oh wow, this is a really thin piece of wood. We're going to put a you know much more obtuse angle on it where it's a lot closer to 90 because it's only that wide, you know? Oh, right. So like if you're using computers, it literally assesses it on a board by board, like not every, how do I put it? Not every stave in the barrel is going to be the same width and the same angle. They'll adjust so they use, if it's a, if it's a thicker board, mm-hmm. they can use more of that wood and have less wastage per, per board. Is that what you're saying? Basically, yeah. Huh, that's pretty cool. Because uh, unfortunately, uh, like the way I described it first, you know, where every board has the same angle, if you put a lot of wide boards next to each other, followed by a lot of sk- narrow boards, you'll have a really flat side to your barrel, followed yeah. by a really, you know, yeah. and you'll end up making Don't ovals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you don't really want that. So, you know, computers alleviate that. If no one has seen the process of like then bending those staves back together, which I'm sure you're going to describe quite well, uh, I'm going to say right now it's worth looking up because it is actually, it's it's quite spectacular, I think is probably the right word for it. It's, uh, I mean, wh- the way we did it, I thought was awesome. Uh, I've also seen the way ISC does it and it's it's much more beautiful and awesome like art driven Mm. Uh, independent stave burns their wood scraps and then they heat uh, bend their staves. So they will literally just have a fire in there and they'll spray water on the staves and they'll just slowly, you know, tighten the top. And since the bottom is in that super heavy iron ring, it's not going anywhere. So the staves just slowly bend, slowly bend until they get into that circle. And then they put another heavy iron bent on there. Uh, Where I worked, we had a steam tunnel, (laughs) which is exactly what it sounds like. It is a tunnel of steam. It's just 240 degree hot water, just, you know, billowing out. And they just impregnate that wood with as much hot water as possible. And then when it comes out, they have a windlass, um, which is effectively an upside down cone uh, with a hole in it that comes down and it just catches all of those pieces of wood that were standing up straight, forces them together uh, into the hole of that upside down cone. And then a incredibly strong man <laughs> throws that iron hoop on top of it and beats it down <laughs> with a sledgehammer to make sure it fits. <laughs> and then it comes apart, raises up, and he does about 1,500 of those a day. <laughs> and I'm guessing that guy is uh, built like a brick shit house. Well, when I worked there, that guy's name was Joe Matt, and Joe Matt was retired military, and Joe Matt was in better shape than when he was in the military. <laughs> so he was he was not someone you wanted to mess with. He was a big guy, man. Oh, dude. Yeah, that's pretty hardcore. Um, if someone's strong enough to do that, are they going to be able to do it? Or is that deceptively uh, intricate work as well? Like, do you have to be have a deft touch for it? deceptively intricate uh because as you're banging it down with your sledgehammer the opposite side wants to pop up Uh, so you have to know exactly where to hit it or you're gonna spend just a very long time you know with your sledge like you know five pound sledge just bang oh whoops bang oh whoops uh, you know and just kind of like a daffy duck (laughs) cartoon where you're just back and forth so it's one of those jobs where you it actually does take more than brute strength. That's pretty cool. Uh, all right, so now uh, now we're at the sexy part, I guess, and we're, we're doing testing. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, so it depends oh, on okay. the cooperage. So some cooperages toast and then char. Some cooperages don't char at all. Some cooperages, cooperages don't toast at all. Um, and every cooperage toasts different than the other. <laughs> Right. Oh, okay. This sounds so like at, at Brown Foreman, um, they toasted, uh, basically they had here in America in front of like grocery stores, we have yellow concrete stoppers that stop people from driving through the grocery store. Mm-hmm. They looked a lot like that, only they just heat up to a certain temperature. 
Um, a, and it's like a giant element, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's like a three foot tall, like a rod, rod that heats up, um, huh. and it's super precise, and it ensures that right the entire barrel is given the same temperature for the exact correct amount of time, because uh, different temperatures uh, bring out different flavors. So I pulled up my little picture here earlier, but. Basically, from 200 degrees freedom units uh, all the way up to 520 degrees is where your kind of toasting profile is. Uh, at 200, it's it's very oaky, like you get a lot more of that oak. And then once you hit 520, you're kind of pushing the edge of almond all the way to too mm. bitter. So in between 200 and 520, uh, you get a couple different flavors. So vanilla tops out at like 400. That's where you can get the most of that. And just kind of, you know, generic sweetness is around 320. Um, good luck converting all these to Celsius because I can't do that in my <laughs> head. That's what Google um, is for, man. That's what yeah, Google is for. If you're listening to this and you want to know, pull up a Google tab. Google's got your right. back. So the the other thing is, the pro oh, let me rephrase that. The problem is those flavors that you pull out um, at those lower temperatures get burned away as you go past them. Uh, because what you're trying to do is break those bonds down to release those you know, certain compounds. So if you're like, I want vanilla and more vanilla than anything else, then you want 400 degrees. But you're also destroying a lot of that oaky like those mm. oak um, lactones that i was talking about earlier and you're going to lose a little bit of that sweetness because you've you broke the bonds down to create those and then you continue to break the bonds down within those flavor compounds so they right. no longer taste like that so it's very much a narrow window that you're selecting uh and it's not like you get the benefit of everything before or everything after it you're just getting what you aim for and that's why time is so important because if you say uh, you're like, I want max vanilla. So I am 400 and I'm going to do it for half an hour. Sweet. Then that means you baked 400 degrees in, you know, how many millimeters, right? And if you do it for an hour, you baked it in many more millimeters, but then it starts to cool off, you know, the further it goes in. So that means, yes, you have maximum vanilla and you destroyed all that oak character and all those sweet compounds until you get four and a half millimeters in. <laughs> and then it started to drop in temperature. And, oh, you're starting to pick up those sweet characters again. And, oh, six and a half millimeters, you know, seven, eight, somewhere in there. Oh, that's where the oak character comes back in. So you have to think about how long you want to age because how far your spirit can get into that wood is how long you need to toast it. And you also have to think about how hard you're charring it because how deep you char, right? Like a level one char, you're, you're effectively going one millimeter into the wood. A level four char, you're going up to seven millimeters into the wood. So if you toast mm. for 20 minutes and then do level four char, you have burned off all, all the things you spent toasting. Right, so there was no point toasting at all because you just now obliterated the entire like all of the wood that was affected by the heat and toasting, you just burnt it to a crisp and now it's gone. And now all you're getting is that transition period from like, cause there's a, a gradient from the charring too, I have to imagine. Right. Like, yes. So, so yeah. So that's why they didn't, you know, that's why toasting's kind of a new thing. It used to be, right. you just charred and then you got that lovely toast gradient behind mm -hmm. the char. So people were like, oh, why do you char? We already have it. And then it's like, Oh, well, if you're going for it, and in particular flavor, you can extend the amount of time that the liquid spends picking up that flavor before it goes deeper into the wood. So what you're saying is it's really freaking complicated. <laughs> it's, I mean, uh, yes and no. Uh, basically what I'm saying is if you get really into toasting things, do a level one char. Like just set your wood on fire right. for 10 right. seconds or less and then put it out and you will get amazing toasted uh, toasted oak flavors, you'll get the vanilla, you'll get the, the kind of caramels, you'll get those lactones, and you'll get everything that was, you know, you were shooting for in the toast. 
Uh, and if you want a heavy char and you still want those toast profiles, you just have to toast much longer. Right, 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 right. So hmm, how do I ask this? Let's say that you're going for a vanilla bomb and you're going to toast it and then do a level one char over the top. If you just toast that for like six hours and the entire stave gets to that temperature, <laughs> does it probably to, leak? Well, <laughs> you probably, yeah, but yeah, I, I'm going over the top here to, to kind of, yeah. um, is longer like, like, does it get to a point where you're just, even if you're at the temperature that gives the flavor that you want, are you working against yourself and it's just, it, it, it's not adding any more vanilla by toasting longer? Do you end up losing from that? Or is it just these practical reasons why you would never toast that long? So it's a kind of a mute point. But realistically, it's practical reasons you would never toast okay. that long because the wood would never go into the barrel that deep that you would need. Or sorry, right. yeah, the, wood, no, the whiskey would never go into the barrel that deeply that you would want to char it yeah. that long to get it that deep into the wood. Could you do it though? Like if you were just throwing a chunk of wood into, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, like put it in your oven at 400 for three hours, see what happens. <laughs> I, I guess my uh, gut reaction to anything like this is that I tend to always err on the side of natural complexity, I guess is the best way for me to answer it. And obviously I don't know what I'm talking about here, but it comes up a lot in whiskey where people are like, oh, I love this flavor and that's what I want. But I feel like I feel like anytime you, you focus specifically on just one thing, everything becomes one-dimensional and boring. Does that make sense? Like vanilla is only fun <laughs> if you have some absolutely and some almond and some like all these other things put them together, right? Like mm-hmm. so just chasing vanilla so... or just chasing oak or just chasing almond by itself is probably a trap is, is what I'm getting at. It is. And it isn't Uh yes. One dimensional flavor is not necessarily what you're going for. However, this is a natural product and it can not, mm. and it will never always do what you want it to the way it's supposed <laughs> to. So it is very, very, very difficult to be like, no, this is perfect. This is 400 degrees. This is max vanilla like right. one dimensional, it will never work perfectly. <laughs> so you will have parts of the wood that don't, you know, hit 400, that go higher than 400. Um, if you're charring like that, obviously helps, right? Cause that takes it well over 500 degrees. So you are going to get that almond. You're going to get that bitter. You're, you're going to get that, you know, grass, you're going to get all that other stuff. Um, also, depending on how long you season is what flavors can break down. So Mm. like oak, vanilla, caramel, almond. And then if you go past almond that bitter, that's for like super well seasoned wood. If you go for kiln dried rather than that, it's kind of, you can get green notes, which are, you know, kind of those, green bell pepper, eucalyptus, grass clipping type notes that a lot of folks can associate with rye, um, acrid. Uh, you can get pencil shaving notes just because, right, you're, you're suddenly you're breaking down bonds using only heat, whereas right. earlier you broke down those bonds using a mechanical means, and then you can further break down those with heat. So also... It's not a complete list of flavors that you can get out, you know, just from that, right? It's just because the book I I got that from was written in the 90s. Uh, It was written by Independence Dave, and it was a presentation they gave because they were, you know, kind of rolling out toasts to the distilling industry. And they were like, guys, really, if you do this, like, you don't have to, like, hope that you have enough vanilla, you know, honey barrels to make your blend you don't have to worry about, oh, God, is it going to be oaky enough? You know, like, 
you know, what if we, it does, you know, we just have a bad year and it's, you know, a long winter and it's not oaky enough and we have to start using, you know, barrels that are a year, two, three years to, older than we want to in order to get those flavor compounds out. So is that a complete list of flavors? No. But it is the main players. Like it's the, the, the obvious. Yeah. Component. It's the biggest the ones. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and this is the thing too, because home, home distillers, uh, or anyone that's played in that area have this horrible uh, way of, well, it's not horrible, it's just a different way of thinking about it in that, um, how do I put it? Home distillers are much more likely to try and create a finished, delicious product in one barrel, which is just not the way it's done in the commercial world, right? Like you want a vanilla bomb in case the average blend doesn't yeah, have enough vanilla. So we go, mm-hmm. oh, we'll take half, you know, we'll put one of these barrels in with the other 50. and yeah, The other 700. Enough. Yeah. And you want something yeah. that's too tannic and you want something that's too peppery and too so on and so forth. Um, right. So if you're a home distiller, um, toasting is helpful because it can kind of point you towards sweeter vanilla or, you know, a little more accurate. But if you are not using charred oak, you're doing it wrong. Barrels do effectively three things in an incredibly broad sense, right? They add flavor, they take flavor away, and they change flavor. Um, If you don't have charcoal, you can't take flavor away. And you really want to take some of those flavors away. (laughs) Like, you know, I I mean, you make stuff. Like, when you taste it straight off the still, uh, you're like, wow, yeah, no, that's that's white dog, (laughs) right? Like, and when I worked at Heaven Hill, right, when we made white dog, it did not taste good. It tasted like corn, stainless steel, alcohol, and caramel. <laughs> not necessarily the most delicious things yeah. you've ever heard in your life. You know, not bad, but definitely not, you know, like, yeah, you know, it's not the award winning, like Henry McKenna that won, you know, all those awards are all, you know, all that. All of yeah. that came from, you know, removing that stainless steel, right? Uh, changing the alcohol and oxidizing it with all the acids. Um, it came from, you know, taking the corn and filtering out some of those copper notes that come along with the corn and, you know, so you have to char. Sorry. So the only way the charring works is because the, the, the spirit is moving in and out of the wood, right? It's literally filtering it as it goes in and out. Is that, I mean, it's effectively activated charcoal. So you can just, I mean, if I've never heard of anyone putting activated charcoal in their white dog, but. That's why charring works. It is activated charcoal. It's effectively like, what what is it? One gram of charcoal has like a thousand square meters of surface area or something like that. It is absolutely insane. Yeah. So that's what you're saying is if you just sprinkled a little bit of powdered activated charcoal over the top of a stainless steel vessel of whiskey, would it have the same effect as a barrel where it's literally a barrier as it's moving in and out of it? Or do you, or do you think that whole movement into and out of the wood is kind of over romanticized? It would still technically move in and out of that powdered activated charcoal. Um, it would just it would move in, and then it would get you know filtered or whatever, and then the next bubble or molecule would bump it out or whatever right, until it just right, becomes right, right. depleted and it can't filter anymore. Yep. The the breathing in and out of the wood, it'll do that with raw wood. It does not have to be charred. It will seep into just completely untre- you know untreated raw oak, vir- like completely virgin. Um, yep. However, like charring it and toasting it does break those bonds down, and it does make it easier to kind of get into those cell walls and start extracting those flavor compounds. All right, cool. So... So we've talked roughly about the the kind of different degrees in terms of toast. Um, and it's basically pick the temperature you want based on the flavor you want and then pick the amount of time you want to decide how deep that certain flavor goes into the wood before you start hitting the, the gradient of fall off in temperature. Mm-hmm. Um, and then how long you want to let the spirit age to reach into that gradient. And we've also talked about the interesting thing, which I hadn't thought about in terms of 
the quality of wood and how seasoned it is. Uh, and I didn't actually get to ask you this. That reminds me. So to go back a conversation or two ago, you're sort of saying that um, the oak you're dealing with is going to change the way you toast it or char it. And what I, th- the way I thought I understood what you were saying is that you're sort of saying if if you've got this wood that's been seasoned really well and it's already gotten rid of a lot of the the tannins you're more able to treat it in a way that would push it towards being tannic because there's less tannin there if that's a creative choice you want to take is that kind of what you're saying whereas if you had a uh, kiln dried oak you wouldn't want to toast it really hot and really hard y- yes and no um right you, you can't put tannins into a barrel uh, like it's, it's bore, you know, when you cut it, it's got whatever tannins it has in it and it cannot have more. Um, all you can do is kind of change the accessibility of those tannins because tannins are the very first thing you pull out of the barrel. You pull it out before you pull out of lactones, you pull it out before you pull out any fur for all you pull just tannins first. So if you can just delay your access to those tannins, so it gives your other flavor compounds a chance to develop before you start pulling those tannins. It can create a much more well-balanced whiskey uh, as you age it, right? Because if the first thing you pull out is tannins and then you just continue to pull out tannins, uh, you're, you're effectively just hoping that the other flavor compounds you know, can overwhelm those tannins uh, and create a balanced whiskey. Otherwise, you know, you're just like, oh, great, yay, yum. My tongue feels weird, and this tastes like <laughs> yeah. vodka, you know? And my teeth hurt. <laughs> <laughs> if you are trying to create, like, a super young whiskey, like a three-month-old whiskey, do you need to be excessively concerned about tannins? No. If you are trying to create, like, a young one- to two-year-old whiskey, do you need to be excessively worried about tannins? God, Yes. Because right. that is the point where the tannins are still being pulled out that the other, you know, nothing else has begun to even come close to hitting it. And the tannins have just swelled to a point that, you know, it's unpalatable, right? And this, I have to imagine, is the reason that Glen Morangi want <laughs> the, uh, the bourbon distillers to fill their barrels first, right? Oh, yeah. So that's another interesting thing. Uh, everything I've been talking about has been uh, virgin oak, like first yep. use. You've never done it before. Uh, if you have a, f- uh, a first fill, so like it's not virgin anymore. This is the first fill you're doing in that barrel. You get approximately one fifth impact. Sorry, Mitch. We had some technical troubles there and got kicked out, uh, but we back into it. Uh, and seeing as both of us are old crazy people, we don't remember where we were. T- at what we were talking about. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I, th- I think what I would like, what I would like to do very much so with someone like you here is to, to maybe give ourselves like four goals to aim for and then get some ideas from you in terms of the best way to accomplish that. Uh, so what is the, what would be the four ends of if you've got at one end of the spectrum it is uh i just like my whiskey smooth (laughs) i I want it to be sweet and approachable and then at the very other end i want it to fight me and i want it to be tannic and spicy and crazy and then what's in between i guess in between is the fairly standard bourbon profile is it um hopefully (laughs) the barrel to get you to each of those Mm -hmm. different places so um so the the nicest sweetest sweetest easiest one is probably the easiest one to talk about um you're gonna want a super heavy toast uh you know kind of in between three and four hundred degrees uh because that way you'll be balancing kind of that sweet caramely note with that vanilla note and Mm. that's kind of vanilla is our brain just picks up as sweet. Uh, you're going to want a level one char. You're going to want what's called a high piece count barrel. Uh, what that means is effectively they went out of their way to put a whole bunch extra staves in it. So instead of having like an average of 29 in it, you're going to have like an average of 40. And that's going to wow. allow the whiskey to oxidize a lot quicker because those 
kind of gr- slats, that's where all that oxygen is going to come through. And when you oxidize something, what you're effectively doing is you're taking an acid and an alcohol and merging it with element oxygen. So not O2 that we breathe, that big fan of, but just O. Um, right. Okay. And that's and that's what creates a lot. You know, all of your like peachios, cherry, um, like your fruit notes, your kind of floral esters. That's where those come from. So any way you can accelerate those, that's how you're going to make you know like a sweeter, more approachable bourbon. Uh, you're going to want to age it um, in the bottom of your rickhouse, relatively cool, not a whole lot of high uh, temperature fluctuations. You don't necessarily want to drive it all you know, into the wood as much as you possibly can. You're just trying to get it into that toasted pro- part and keep it in that toasted part that you toasted to. Um, and you will come out with a really gorgeous, sweet, hopefully slightly more complex because of that high piece count where you've oxidized some and created those cherry peachio kind of flower notes and then proof it down to 80. Right? <laughs> yeah, right, and yeah. you'll, you know, you'll be like, all right, this is pretty good. Whiskey for the masses. Whiskey. I said whiskey for the masses. Oh, I mean, the great thing about whiskey for the masses is I am a member of the masses. So like I get to drink it too. Right. Um, <laughs> Really, there's not necessarily a way to find, right, like a super aggressive bourbon. Uh, You're going to want to char it higher than a level one. I would recommend level three char. Uh, If you toast it, you know, you're not necessarily going for uh, a vanilla or anything like that. Um, I would probably toast a little higher at like 420 um, because that will drive the toast a little further into the barrel. Uh, you're going to want to age it in the the hottest, like the top of your rickhouse where the temperature fluctuations are wild and it gets super, super hot because it will drive it further into that wood. Uh, it will pick up all of those flavors all the way through the wood. So you're going to be picking up, you know, your almonds, your vanillas, your vegetal notes, your to- toasted smoky notes, your fur for alls, all of that stuff. Um doesn't really matter that much about the piece count because when you are in a, that high part of the warehouse, you're going to be evaporating a lot more. And because you're evaporating a lot more, that's going to take care of that oxidization for you. So you are going to get some of that complexity. If at all possible, you're going to want to have uh, a stave with really tight grain because that's going to increase the amount of extratives or amount of flavor compounds that are in that barrel. And you're really going to be shooting for those fur for alls. And really what you're going to be doing is you're going to be going a little deeper into your tails uh, to pull out some of those more fun and funky acids. Uh, I know it sounds weird, but butyric and acetic and all those acids taste disgusting in white dog, <laughs> but oxidize into absolutely delicious and lovely things. Yeah, um, is a beautiful thing, man. It really is, right? Um, and then, you know, don't put any water in it. Like, uh, you're <laughs> going to want to put that thing in there at 100, uh, 125 proof yeah. um, and just ride it out. Like, ride that lightning, right? Um, <laughs> and at the end, you're, you're going to have a, a bourbon that, you know, you, you don't take home to mama. Like, I, I don't know how to put it, right? It's, it's going to be... All about flavor all the time, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like I say, that, that you, you've just des- described the extreme, right? So if you're kind of, yeah. uh, if you're messing around at home, I would say you probably want to mess with the spectrum in, in between, right? Um, I, yeah, I, I, um, so fun things to mess with if you're not necessarily into like toasting and all that stuff. Mess with your uh, like barrel entry proof. Because like I said, certain flavor compounds break down in water, others break down in alcohol. So as you adjust the percentage of alcohol and the percentage of water you put in there, you'll pull out different compounds. Uh, Generally, if you start hitting closer to 100 proof, instead of 125 proof, you'll be starting to pull out a little sweeter compounds. Uh, Whereas if you put it at 125 proof, like, welcome to the big boys. That's where they get that, you know, half of that rye spice that everybody talks about in bourbon is like wood spice 
Yeah, right. So, and what would you say is the tipping point in terms of the average between the two? Is it just literally linear right in between or is it, does it lean it's one way or the other? not. Um, so here in Kentucky, most folks do 125 or uh, 109 or less. So I can't tell you about 110 through 124. I just don't know. Just because um, do it. Interesting. Yeah, they just, they you know, if you're doing 125, you're doing, you know, you're trying to get as much as you can out of that barrel. When you're putting less in there, you're making a very conscious decision about, you know, I am trying to get a different flavor profile. So they are taking a big step away from mm. that because you're not going to be like, hey, I want to make 10% less whiskey and have a 2% flavor distance, right? Like, right, yeah. no, you want to make... 15% less whiskey, but have a very obvious flavor difference. So uh, 109 and below. Uh, I know Michter's and Peerless, I think, are 107 and 109. Um, oh, my goodness. In Colorado, Leopold Brothers is 100 flat even. Um, so if you can get your hands on any of those and compare it to Jim Beam, Heaven Hill, Four Rose, that sort of thing. You can see a little bit of what that does. Mm. But uh, if you're going to play with proof, 110 or below. Uh, there's one other flavor that's been kind of pestering me and I've been chasing around for a little while. Uh, and that is the cherry note. Cherry. Uh, yes, that is the estrification of... So it's actually two esterifications, and I don't remember the proper terms, uh, but acetone es esterifies, and it cre starts tasting like nail polish. And then that will esterify again, and that turns into cherry, which I used to know the scientific <laughs> name for, but I name. don't anymore. But really, it's, it's a product of time. So if you have created a whiskey where you're like, this tastes like nail polish, you are probably six to eight months away from this is a cherry bomb. Interesting. The uh, mysterious ways. <laughs> uh, but yeah. I also read that 12, no, not 12 years ago, seven, eight years ago. And I'm really thinking back on that. And I want to say that's what it is. So I could be completely wrong and talking out of my butt, but <laughs> I, I remember nail polish led to cherry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, one last stab at this. If you just wanted to make a completely uh, like a totally traditional tasting bourbon, what would be your treatment of the, the barrel and in the maturation? Treatment a uh, completely traditional um actually and probably it's probably worth you defining what you would consider a uh, traditional bourbon by picking a like a common bourbon let's just go heaven hill okay heaven right. hill <laughs> funny um, it's almost like you yeah. would know what <laughs> it's almost like uh so everything i say is my own personal opinion it has no bearing on anything heaven hill actually thinks or does but uh <laughs> if i was heaven hill or if i was trying to make heaven hill um, I would try and get staves six months to a year, uh, air seasoned, char three, no toast, uh, normal piece count staves, no high piece count, anything like that. Uh, if I was trying to make kind of the lower end Heaven's Hill stuff, uh, you know, I'd keep that kind of towards the bottom of the warehouse. If I was trying to make the higher end stuff, I'd uh, expose that to a little higher temperatures and age it a little longer. Um, I'd, pr I'd put it in at the barrel pretty high. It is a heritage brand, so they're not going for the low 100, 107, 109. So 125 is a pretty good idea. Uh, you're also looking at what uh, proof it comes off of the uh, still at that point before you uh, proof it down uh, to go into the barrel, because that'll also decide what factors you're going off of. Um, but really, the, the heritage brands... Uh, it's almost a commodity market. Hmm. So they are 
You know, they're not going to do like the artists in Cognac. We're going to air season this for two years. We're going to, you know, dial in the perfect temperature and toast it for exactly 32 minutes and 14 seconds. We are going to, you know, cut grooves into this so that, you know, it increases surface (laughs) area. They are about, hey, we need 50,000 of this. And we want it to be as close to the same as every other, you know, of all 50,000 of them. And anytime you introduce a variable, that's another instance that it could be different, right? Right, right. So it really is just uh, terrifying to do anything but what's been done in the past. Yes, and I mean, yeah, but I mean, if you went out and you bought Jack Daniels and it tasted nothing like your previous bottle of Jack Daniels, even if it tasted better, you would be furious. <laughs> like, where is my Jack Daniels, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. When you're in the heritage game, the name of the game is keeping it the same, right? So you want to remove all, you know, all variation because the people that go out to buy Jack Daniels want Jack Daniels. It doesn't matter if you can make Jack 2.0 where it's sweeter and better and everyone likes it more. You know, like they want Jack. Yeah, completely understandable. All right, man. Uh, this has been an absolute blast and you've given me a whole lot to think about. I'm sure a bunch of other people have suddenly got a whole lot to think about as well. So uh, I really hope that we get to catch up in Texas this year. That'd be great. I'll make sure to hunt you down and uh, shake your hand and have a drink with you. Uh, I'm sure everyone that's listened to this is very thankful for the information that you've given. So thanks, man. We, we thoroughly appreciate it. Thank you. It's I know I rambled, but it's, (laughs) I have too much fun talking about it. So thank you.